What's up, Compete Training Academy family? Welcome to the Compete Mentality Podcast. The mission of the Compete Mentality Podcast is to motivate, educate, and inspire others to compete. No matter what area of life you are in, we are all called to compete. Our definition of competing is doing what God is calling you to do, even when it's hard. This episode of the Compete Mentality Podcast is sponsored by the Lewis Jackson and Jordan Delks Basketball School. Be looking for details coming here in April on our social media platforms. It is now my pleasure to introduce my former Purdue basketball star and old friend, Tyrone Johnson. T, thanks for coming on, man. Oh, no problem, man. Don't give me that much credit, but I appreciate you bringing me on. I really do. Hey, absolutely, man. And I'm, I'm so excited to dive in. And uh, for, for our listeners, T and I, we got to spend a year together. Uh, at Purdue men's basketball uh, when I was a manager and uh, T was a, a big part of our success that year at Purdue and he had a fantastic career at Purdue and uh, he's also an Indianapolis legend and so I don't want to uh, steal too much of his thunder so we're going to dive right on <laughs> it but T we really uh, you're doing big things out in California right now we always start this podcast off with just a, a question uh uh, that Cordy and I, man, we're, we're big, uh, we're big trainers. We love to help, uh, you know, keep Hoopers accountable and that's on the court, off the court, you know, nutrition's a big part, you know, eating right now. Oh, man. Man. We, we love, we love our cheat meals, man. And trying new places. <laughs> and stuff like that. And uh, I'm curious, man, you being out in Cali, man, what's your favorite restaurant out there? Man, like you said, I'm, I'm literally just now jumping back into the, you know, getting in shape and stuff, man. I got, I got up there, but, um, <laughs> but you know, I've been, I've actually been sticking to my diet, man, here over the last two months and just, you know, slowly but surely shredding things down. And that's huge. Like you said, it's nutrition, but you know, when on that cheat day, <laughs> right, right. you know, my, my, my favorite, my favorite restaurant here, man, is, it's called Boiling Crab. Um, and what it is, it's like a, it's like a Louisiana Creole style, um, seafood, um, where you actually, you know, when you sit down, they actually put like a big sheet of paper out on your, uh, on your table. They bring your shrimp, your clams, your whatever you got in this nice little sauce and, and you actually eat on the table. So like you, you put your ketchup down on the table and you just, yep. and they give you gloves and a bib and you just go in, man. It's actually oh. pretty dope. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's my, I'm, I'm a seafood guy. Um, so that's my that's my favorite place to go. Um, you know, it's not too, too expensive either. Um, and it's something that, you know, I go and enjoy. I love their wings. I love their catfish as well. Um, but I know that y'all that y'all normally ask the smoker question and, I, and I'm, I'm going to be on that soon. Trust me. Uh, my, <laughs> my father-in-law and my, my uncle, my, my wife's uncle, uh, Lauren's uncle man, they stay smoking stuff and it just make me want to just, you know, get into it. But um, they, they, they really smoke some good brisket and some good tri-tip, bro. And they do a okay. real good job at it, man. And I, you know, I'll be over there. That's another cheat meal that I just tear up, bro. So. <laughs> I, I love it, man. I love it. I, I, that's a, that's a restaurant that's right up my alley. No doubt about it. So got my mouth watering right now, man. <laughs> Here in Indiana, it's 430. So dinner's coming up, man. You got me hungry. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh man, it's 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 uh baked fish and broccoli for me tonight. They, I like it. I like it. You, know, you stick with it, man. You just keep killing it. But T, uh, for those of you uh, who uh, don't know Tyrone, uh, T, just give us your background and how you got to okay. where you are today, man. Um, you know, I grew up um, inner city Indianapolis area. Um, I was I grew up on the west side of Indianapolis. I ended up going to high school on the north side of Indianapolis. Um, at North Central, but I, you know, I started playing basketball at a very young age. Uh, my mom and my my dad, you know, they got me into it. I've probably been playing basketball, man, since I was three, four years old, believe it or not. And, um, you know, went up through the municipal gardens, um, yeah. you know, travel leagues, all of that stuff, league, super competitive. I mean, at the municipal gardens, just to ring off a few names that I remember playing against, you know, Eric Gordon, Evan Gordon, Marcus T, Jeff T, Mike Conley. I mean, I'm talking about everybody came through there, bro. So that's oh. kind of like my, my upbringing. Um, and, you know, I had a cousin uh, who we call Hoodie, and he, he was like the best basketball player in our family to me at that time. And I just looked up to him so much, bro. And uh, he, he had the craziest handles, and I always wanted my handles to be like that. Um, but I was almost always around his height, but I was three years younger, you know, so he used to take me to go play 
with the older guys and stuff in the neighborhood. You know, we used to go play at the parks, Arsenal Park in Indianapolis, uh, Tibbs Park in Indianapolis. And that got me kind of like my grit because I'm like, man, these dudes is killing me. And I want to be out be able to play out there without being scared. So, you know, he used to put me out there like, nah, come on, you with us. You know, so I used to play, um, you know, with the, with the older guys. And that really got me my grit for the game, you know, pushing off you know, people foul and stuff like that. And uh, so when I went back and played with my age group, it was almost like easier, you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, just to move a little bit forward, went to high school at North Central High School. Um, and, you know, I was played behind Eric Gordon my freshman year. So I actually played JV my freshman year. Um, and obviously I wasn't gonna play over Eric Gordon. He was the number one player in the nation, <laughs> but taught me a lot, you know, it really did. And, and, you know, going into my sophomore year, got a lot of, you know, hype around me, just playing in the summer leagues and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, got an offer from Purdue, committed after my sophomore year, actually. Um, and then we won a state championship there at North Central. Um, and then I, you know, went on to Purdue. Obviously when I got there, Jawan, um, Etwine, Robbie, they was the big guys on campus. So there we are, I'm turning back around again and I'm the, I'm at the lowest of the totem pole again. So, um, but you know, that that was a really good learning lesson, learning year, re very good year, very good season. We would have went a lot further. VCU chipped us, man, that year that they, that they went to the final four. But, um, but yeah, and then, you know, had a pretty solid career. Wish I would have did a little bit better at the end of my career uh, with the young guys. But, you know, um, all in all, learned so many lessons about life throughout my whole entire basketball career, played a little bit overseas, two years. Um, and then after that, you know, moved out here to California where now I'm, you know, I'm the real estate guy now. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's fantastic, T. And man, like, but while you're telling me your story, man, I, I honestly is getting chills. You, you just, you know, t talking about just your work ethic and playing, playing up, playing against older guys. And that's how you developed Absolutely. your grit and toughness and like, Man, that, that's what I tell kids all the time at Compete Training Academy. Like, for you to get better, man, you got to play against older guys. You got to play. Oh, that's absolutely. How you do, yeah, that's how you get develop uh, physicality mm -hmm. and embracing that toughness and grit. And, uh, man, that's that's the – I mean, you listed some Indiana basketball legends just rattling. Oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> David Teague was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about, okay. you know, how he, he got cut as a sophomore. And like he wow, he, yeah, because he was he was around some heavy guys at yeah, like JV <laughs> JV as a junior, all that to say, like, man, where you're where you're growing up in Indianapolis, like you're playing against the best players in the country. Mm -hmm. Like period. <laughs> and, and so uh that's just so cool. And I, I want to take bits and pieces from your story to kind of develop this podcast. And uh, I remember watching Almost you definitely. in high school, uh coming to mm -hmm. some of your games. I, I'm a diehard bowler maker. Uh, I'm a third right. gen third generation Purdue graduate, um, and I remember when you were signing everything. Uh, me and my dad coming down watching you play, and I'm like, "Okay, man, he's tough." He's tough. <laughs> and, uh, That's what's I, up, man. I never I, knew that. <laughs> you, got, you got to play at uh, just a, I mean, at a legendary high school in North Central. That's just produced, you know, NBA player after NBA player. Exactly. What was it like? Kind of like you were talking about it, just telling us about your background. What was it like playing for the North Central Panthers? And just give us some some of your good memories. Man, it was wonderful, man. You know, um, I have to give hats off to the program because the thing is, is that, you know, I grew up without, you know, my father in my life. So a lot of my coaches was actually um, pretty much like a, a, a father from home, right? Um, so I had a lot of good coaches throughout my North Central. Like when I, when I got into Washington Township, so I grew up on the West Side, like I said, and I would actually live there all the way up until seventh grade, um, or oh, up until eighth grade. And so when we moved out to the North Side, I really didn't have no one. You know what I mean? So it was just my mom. It was me. Um, and so I I met Coach Green, which was my I, I met Coach Y first, uh, Gartanian Y, who played for North Central. Um, and he coached me in eighth grade. He kind of gave me kind of the seeds of, you know, hey, man, if you want to do this, you got to get serious. Like, you can't be playing around, missing practice, missing class, stuff like that, you know. Um, and still to this day, like, I just sat down and had a cigar with him, like, you know, about a couple months ago, just just talking about, you know, just when he first saw me, kind of, you know, learn my family history, all that type of stuff. Then it moved on to the summer league, going into North Central with Coach Green. Um, he was huge in my recruiting process because he ended up coaching me 
um, in travel league, Matt Green. Um, and so all throughout my, like he was with me every day. I mean, every, every coach, anybody, they kind of came through him and coach Mitchell, who is the top of the top. Like, I feel like coach Mitchell is in my opinion, the best Indiana high school basketball coach ever. And I'm, I'm saying that right now. That's my uh, dog. That, that'd man. be, that'd and, be hard to argue. That'd be hard to argue, man. And the crazy thing is I was scared of him when I first got <laughs> sure. there. I ain't never been really scared of nobody, but like when I, my first open gym that I came, I was coming from eighth grade to, um, to the high school open gym and he just man he he got in my ass like got in our ass about getting on the court like we was trying to get on the court you know whatever so we just like we got next like we just gonna play with straight eighth graders and then whatever and so you know I started giving it to some dudes and he was like he was going off on them bro like in open gym so I'm like damn I'm like he's serious this is open gym this ain't like practice or nothing he he holding it like it is but it's not um so you know I ended up getting a good relationship with him. So I played JV my freshman year, like I said. Um, and then um, the reason why I'm explaining this because it's not like a jump to greatness for me. Like I tore my ACL going into my um, freshman year. So I couldn't even really show my game up until season time, until up until tryouts. And I had this big, long knee brace on once I did that, right? Probably three steps slower than everything, you know, everyone. And not only that, I'm not this kid that's coming from this township. So they're just now knowing who I am, right? Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of dudes that was in front of me, to be completely honest, that, that really should have went in front of me. But I'm like, nah, I know I, I got this. I know I can be this star player at, at North Central. Once I played with Eric Gordon and, you know, started to get with him. But um, I was like, man, I can definitely do this. So, you know, he set me out my freshman year. He set me out of the state game. Um, and he played someone else. So I actually didn't even dress. Like I actually set out. Um, I used to dress varsity, but I, I set out. And everybody was like, why would you do that? Because I was actually coming into my own. Like the last couple of games of the season, I played a lot of big games and stuff like that. Um, and we lost to Etwan Moore and, uh, and KK, you know, over at uh, yeah. over at, uh, at East Chicago. Yep, I, I was that game. I was that game. Yeah, I was. Oh, uh, word. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I was pissed, bro. Like I was actually hot that I, I was sad, bro, that I didn't, I wasn't able to play. Like I remember telling my mom, like, man, damn, like, and it was different from today's kids. Cause I feel like today's kids would have said, I'm gone. Like I'm going somewhere else. Right. Because supposedly, you know, next in line was going to be Evan Gordon and, you know, I'm gonna have to wait behind him again. And then I'm gonna have to do, this is how people think nowadays. Well, my, yep. my mentality was, nah, this is like playing with the older guys. again. Like, let me go at these dudes. So, I, you know, he told me the last game after that last game that, hey, if you if you work hard, it's going to be your show. So I was like, let's do it then. So, you know, sophomore year came out right off the bat, started, you know, I want to say I had like 25 points the first game, boom, averaged like 18, 19 that year. So it was like, oh, yeah, he's serious. So I got a lot of offers, you know, um, early on, but I don't want to get into that now because I know that's coming later. But sure. one of my most fondest memories at North Central, um, I have two. Um, one was a funny one because I'm a freshman. Like I said, I'm, I'm coming in. Um, I'm playing in practice. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I'm killing the varsity team because I'm on JV right now. And I'm starting to get my wits about myself again. It's probably like, you know, beginning of the season, starting to get my step back a little bit more. Um, and, but but Eric Gordon's guarding me and I'm killing him. And he like, uh, he like, oh, hold the, you know, hold the hell up. So he stopped practice. He like cussing at Eric out like right in front of me. And I'm like, why he do that to him? He's about to tear me up now, right? right? So he's like, he's like, if he scores another basket, all of y'all are on the line. Bro, I scored not another basket the whole time. Right? <laughs> EJ locked me down, bro. But it was, you know, he was showing me as a senior, he was quicker, he was stronger, he was faster. I was like, man, I thought I was doing something, but yeah. I ain't did nothing yet. Yeah. Um, but that was that was one of the funny memories. And then obviously, man, that state championship team, just the whole year up until that state championship, bro, was one of our like one of my best memories in basketball ever. Right. Probably is the my favorite mem basketball sure. memory ever, bro, because just like you always talk about, yeah, winning state, we're going to win state. We're supposed to win state this year. It's hype, blah, blah, blah. And I was able to, you know, commit to Purdue and get that off my mind. The process of, you know, going to college where I'm going to go and all of that stuff yep. and focus on that. And, bro, we was like laser focused when I tell you. And when I tell you everybody was on board from, from me, the star player, to my brother, to 
Devontae, all the way down oh. to our managers, bro. Like everybody was on board. And it was crazy. Um, but that really helped me like springboard, you know, in the college and stuff, because we kind of held things like a college atmosphere even even then. You know what I mean? Like it was no yeah. BS. But man, one of the biggest memories was that state championship. And just as soon as that, as soon as the um as soon as the buzzer rang off, bro, like we were just so hyped, you know, <laughs> jumping around. Yeah. I, the video is crazy if you see it now. I even caught a headache just from being so excited, bro. Like I was like, dang, like I actually have a headache once we got <laughs> in the locker room and stuff. Right, it was crazy. Right. But yeah, it was it was fun, man. That that was a great time in my life for sure. Man, I, I love that. And uh I'll never I'll never forget John Wooden's quote of he, he won 10 national championships at UCLA and he said I'd trade all all man. 10. All 10 for one Indiana high school state championship. Man, it, and, man. and it was so serious, man. It yeah. Was serious. <laughs> yeah, 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 and he, he was serious. And so, it is, man. You're, you're right, just because every hooper in Indiana, I mean, growing up, mm -hmm. just like you said, playing it when you're three, four, five, six years old, growing all the way up, yep. we dream about wearing those blue medals, man. Like, and man, doing that, just man, because man. it means so much here in Indiana, it means so much it to does. your community. Uh, to your mm -hmm. family, to your friends, like it, it's just basketball is such a way of life here in Indiana. Exactly, bro. And like exactly. it, it's just it gives you know inspiration to 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds that are just so hyped bro. about their team, their local high school going to state and winning the state. Man, so what that's Coach Mitchell. One of his favorite quotes that season that he used to say was like, "We're gonna all be here." 15 years from now, we're going to be doing like this and we're going to have that ring on. We're going to be having us <laughs> some cocktails and we're going to be saying we won that, mother. you know, whatever. That's right. that's but man, right. he used to, he used to go crazy. And that's exactly, he, you know, he came to my wedding here and we took a picture with our rings on like, Hey, yeah, we man. did it. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously almost 10 years later. Right. <laughs> Bro, that, that, just, hilarious, that man. just gave me chills, man. That's fantastic. Man. It was but, huge. Uh, See, uh, I'm training a lot of hoopers right now going through the recruiting process, and it's it can be really confusing mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. it's just really hard, stressful. And so just share your journey of uh, going through your recruiting process all the way from when it started to who recruited you and how you ended up choosing Purdue, just because I know a lot of my hoopers can glean uh, and learn from your story. Absolutely, bro. So, yeah. So for me, um, like I said, I wasn't like um, – highly sought after at first right um when I say that I mean like there's kids nowadays seventh and eighth grade they already known on the national level I was actually ranked higher like when I when I was like fifth sixth grade which means nothing right um <laughs> it means nothing those same guys that was ahead of me like I don't even know where they are you know I never saw them like actually make it anywhere besides Yogi uh, <laughs> but like um you know, when I got to high school, like I said, I tore my ACL going into my freshman year, bro. I cried like crazy, like, cause I'm thinking my career is over. Like, I got a torn ACL. Like, I always hear about that, you know, whatever. I had great surgery, though, got back to it. Um, but, you know, I would say my actual recruiting process started after my freshman season. When I went into that summer, like, I just took it on. Like, I wasn't thinking about let me impress coaches. And I think that's something that's huge with kids nowadays like don't think about hey I have to impress this coach because he's here I have to like just play your game and get better over time and your mm. game is going to speak for itself like this is one place one sport that your game can speak for itself you don't have to be out here saying hey I'm this good I'm that good your game will speak for itself for one um and I think that's something that I always had it was like no excuses I don't care who's in front of me I don't care if this dude is supposed to be number one in the state whatever he's supposed to be I'm going to go at them just like I go at the dude, you know, that's not supposed to be one, number one in the state. Um, and that was something that I did going into that sophomore year. Um, and so by the time I started my sophomore year, I had, you know, about three offers. It was Purdue, it was Cincinnati, and it was, um, who was the third one? Butler. It was Butler. So I had a few good D1 offers, um, but I had a lot of bigger, big colleges looking at me as well. I had, you know, the UCLA, the, um, Michigan State, Ohio State. So I went on a lot of like unofficial visits, like going into my sophomore year, which was crazy. Um, and then uh, right after my sophomore year. And then um, the thing for me, because when, when you're when you're going through your recruiting process, like you want to go somewhere where you're welcome. Right. Not just they don't just want you because you're good. Like, I think that's two separate things. Um, and for me, you know, with Coach Painter, 
and <clears throat> it was Coach Lust and Coach Painter, who we just got back. Shout out to Coach Lust. <laughs> right, right. Uh, he just texted me today. He just texted me today. I was super hyped, bro. But anyway, That's cool. um, but they were like at everything. So like open gyms all the way up to um, games, to travel games, anywhere that they could be that I was at, they were there, right? Other head coaches wasn't. So I see Coach Painter at these games, but I see other coaches, assistant coaches here, right? right. That's kind of, that was kind of, you know, that, that made an imprint on me. Like, I'm like, dang, like, Coach Painter is here. He over there sitting, you know, big dude. I'm like, hey, he's at all my stuff. He's at my open gym. So he's driving down an hour on a Wednesday night to watch me at open gym. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or watch For me sure. in practice, whatever it might be. So that was something that was huge to me. Um, a second thing for me, you know, going through the process is like who's doing things the right way, right? So at yeah. the time, you know, I, I didn't have no guidance. So a lot of people, you know, my mom was my guidance. Coach Mitchell, uh, uh, Matt Green was my guidance. I didn't have like a dad that was just kind of like over me that was like, hey, you working out at this time, you working out at that time. Um, or, you know, hey, let's make this decision together. So, you know, for me, it was all about feeling like feeling like a family. So when I came to Purdue's campus, even before I committed, even on my unofficial visits, everybody made me feel like I was at home, right? Um, and I think that that was something that's huge for me. But going through the you know process of recruiting, just don't get too wrapped up in pressuring yourself over you know getting a scholarship. Uh, I'll take it to my brother who didn't get a scholarship, D1 offers until his senior year, right? right? Who who didn't who was looked like a little. <laughs> You know, he was he was so small, like he, yeah. people just didn't believe it until he got a little bigger and came into his body and stuff like that. But he just kept playing. He never was crying about. He saw all of his other friends getting offered, Yogi, you know, Gary, all of those guys. Um, and he saw all of those guys getting offered. And even Devontae right there at home, you know, yeah. right in the same team. And he just hadn't got that that break yet, but he kept playing. I think that's something that's huge these, these days is don't get wrapped up in these YouTube videos, all of that stuff. You got a trainer great trainer like you in front of you go with your trainer get more work in get better see the progress over time and you know the recruiters and and all of the college will come to you once you prove that on the court man I, I think there's so much we can take from that as hoopers and I love that you say just don't get wrapped up uh and let your game speak for itself and man exactly these, these days social media is crazy and uh, it is it, we, it we, is <laughs> I unfortunately, T, I, I see kids getting so wrapped up and they go to the gym and, you know, they're taking a selfie or whatever and like, exactly yeah, wh whatever, man, like just go to the gym and work because you want to get better and you want, you want, right. and that's how Tyrone developed his mentality. He didn't care. He didn't, he didn't talk a big game. He let his game speak for itself. And exactly. I, I, can, I can testify to that uh, by seeing his work ethic at Purdue. And so, T, I, I just want to kind of transition the conversation to Purdue basketball. And Purdue, mm -hmm. uh, our motto is play hard, man. Like, we're known Absolutely. for playing tough basketball. And uh, I just want you to, like, talk about one of uh, maybe the toughest practices or memories you've had of a practice being just an all-out war that, uh, you know, some of the fans don't know about just kind of behind the scenes that, you know, maybe you got into it with another player or something, but we love competition here at CTA, and that's just good old, like you're talking about, good old fashioned right. hard competition because you love the game and you love the win. Tell us <clears throat> exactly, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of we had a lot, we had a lot of those practices actually. Um, am I still there? Yeah, yeah. I cut out. Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, um, we had a lot of those practices actually, <laughs> man. Um, sure. and, and what's crazy is. You know, from day one, it was like that. So when I even came into open gyms, the first open gyms, I mean, they were so serious. Like, I'm like, like, you know, other open gyms I played in with other colleges and stuff like that. Like, it was all play around. You know, you go lay it up, you might get through. Nah, people slapping you. And defense has to give you fouls. And that's how it was with at Purdue, right? So I'm like, damn. So, like, I can just foul the piss out of somebody if I'm mad and I don't have to give them the foul. Well, they going to – when you don't give them that, they're going to get you the same way. So you can imagine how those open gyms was. So <laughs> yeah. even going into practice, I was like, man, like this is tough. Right. Um, but I would have to say, you know, one of the, one of the most craziest practices that I had 
um, was my freshman year when uh, um, I forget why Coach Painter left practice, right? Um, but he had to leave practice. And normally, just naturally, when your head coach leaves practice, like people like, ah, uh, like they, they kind of, you know, back up oh, a little yeah. bit. They kind of, you know, getting a little more lackadaisical, et cetera. But man, when I tell you, Coach Jackson was there at the time. Um, and he was like, he started going off on us. He like, don't even think that, you know, the, the fact that Coach Painter is gone, that y'all going, you know, chill out and, and, and this is going to be an easy practice. And we still got half a practice left. So people started going at each other's heads. I'm talking about like crazy. It started to go crazy, bro. So uh, I remember it was me and Lou. We was on one team, me and Louis Jackson. And then um, Etwan was on the other team as the guard. And I think it was either Kelsey, Kelsey and Etwan. And when I tell you, like, it was like two on two, it was, we was still playing, like, you know, doing our drills, but it was almost like two on two. Like, we was going at each other's head. And I remember, you know, Etwan, like, you know, doing one of the, you know how Etwan used yeah. to get in oh, practice, yeah, yeah. bro. He used to, he would, he would swipe you out the way. I remember he swiped me in the face. I'm like, bro, I pushed him, you know, I'm like, what's up? Like, what, what's going on? You know what I mean? And and I remember he did the same thing to Lou, and you know how Lou get, he going yeah. crazy. But, like, that was one of the craziest practices that I had just because it's like we was playing like we was in a game. Like, we was, like, for it was like it was for a championship. I remember leaving off the floor, and I'm like, damn, that was just practice. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and that was one of the most, like, competitive practices I remember, you know. But you got to think about it. I mean, we went at it. All, all of us, we had John Hart that year. We had Kelsey Barlow. We had me. We had uh, Etwan. We had Lewis Jackson. We had Ryan, DJ. Uh, we had some crazy battles just all year because one thing that Coach Painter would always say is your spot is never safe here. If yes. you're getting outplayed, like he told me when I came in, like, you know, I'm not giving you anything. Like, if you, if you want to start or if you want to, you know, play in front of this person, then you outperform them. And that was always on my mind, like whether we was running, whether we was, you know, in practice. Because my biggest favorite thing was competitive drills. Like I used to love winning those competitive drills. Like I just want to go back and see how many competitive drills I won. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> because sure. Because that was something that's huge. But, but once we get in those competitive drills, it's so intense, bro. And everybody wants to win. Not only because you got to run after, but because if this dude beat me in too many competitive drills, he's going to take my spot <laughs> at some point. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, Coach Painter would – I love that he kept that vibe because then everybody's playing hard knowing that that spot can be taken at any time, bro. Absolutely. And I love those stories because that, that's really what competing is all about. And uh, Definitely. I, I, I love, I love uh, just the mentality that you played with. And uh, that's, that's – for the, you hoopers listening to this, like, just like Terrell's saying, he played that way in practice. And, like, right. that carries over to games. So – and I'm telling you right now, you got to train that way too. You got to practice that way. You got to train yeah. that way. If you want to reach your goals and get where you want to be. And that's what, that's how T approached the game. And T on the D1 kind of, level, yeah, <laughs> not to cut you off, but on the D1 level, you get to a point where you notice practice is actually harder than the games. <laughs> you know what sure. I mean? So, so you better be working hard in practice because you can get your spot taken any day, but also, Practice is actually harder than games. So if you're going hard as you can in practice in the game, you're gonna be like, damn, this is easy. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm not tired. <laughs> you know, <laughs> two and a half, three hours of an all-out exactly. war, where yep. a game's 40 minutes. So like exactly. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't be more right. <laughs> I couldn't agree more Definitely. with that statement. But <laughs> T uh it's so cool to hear uh just the way you developed yourself as a player, just growing up. And uh, I'd mm -hmm. love to hear uh, just kind of your player development philosophy uh, for just talking to uh, the players that are listening to this right now. How did you become such a great player? Um, just with, the, you know, you poured into your brothers and, uh, you know, help, help develop them. What is your, as far as training goes, what is your player development mm -hmm. philosophy for the players that you've trained? Um, so like, like for me, um, it all comes down to like, do you want it? Right. Cause I don't want you out here just because you just want to shoot around. Right. Like that's anybody, 
in in America, you know, when they see a basketball coach, Penner, we say this all the time. Basketball is like the most sport that you see people like just pick a random person, just pick up a basketball. If it's just sitting there, they're gonna shoot, they're gonna shoot around. You know, you go out on the baseball field, they see a baseball, they're probably not gonna pick up the baseball and start hitting bats with it. Like it's just it's it's a sport that like people can play around with, right? right. Um, but at the same time, for for me, it was always something like once I step across the lines, like I'm there for business, right? And that's how I felt. So first and foremost, like wanna be there, like be happy about being there. If you don't want to be there, you know. And, and and then you're not really looking to be competitive, right? Um, so early on, like I said, I played with a lot of older guys. I really didn't have a lot of like direct training. You know, Red Taylor out of India, out of Indianapolis, legend, bro, legend. Yeah. It's actually who turned me on to like organized basketball at right. like you know 10 years old, 11 years old, right? Um, and that's when I really got like the knack for it because we're having real practices. We're doing three man weave, you know, we're doing all of these other stuff, you know, competitive drills, stuff like that. That's just like, dang, like this is what basketball is about. Right. So, um, but you know, moving along for me, it was getting a lot of reps in. So, you know, whether that's on, um, whether that's playing basketball, you got to get some playing in. I feel like people nowadays, they only, they see all these sexy drills and stuff like yeah. that, that that's online. Those are cool. And those are, those are developing your game, but also get out there and play. Believe it or not, bro, I used to leave practice in high school and I'd go and hoop in an open gym across town and then go train with my trainer after that, <laughs> Sean Bowden. I'll go train yeah. with him after that. And then I'll go home. Like it was crazy, like two or three nights a week. Cause I just wanted to play more and more all the way up. Like it was funny, even on our, um, and I'll come back to it, but even on our um, regional, the year that we won champ, the state championship, our, our regional championship game, there's two games in one day. And right. so we, we play right there at Butler. My mom lives like ten, five minutes away from Butler. So all of us came back to our house. And next thing you know, we got a basketball game going outside, bro. Like they like, Hey, let's cut it out. Like, <laughs> y'all play, like, later tonight for the regional championship, you know what You're I mean? Right. Like, bro, go sit down somewhere. You know, it was me, yeah. Darius Latham, uh, Ronnie, and Patrick, you know. Oh, like, yeah. We, we just loved playing, you know what I mean? So, and that we just felt like that developed – I feel like that developed my game a ton. I was playing against older guys. I got to play against different styles. But I used the stuff that I learned in my individual workouts while I was playing open gyms and stuff. Like, don't just get in open gyms, and now you lost everything – that you've been training for, right? So when I when I I wish I had a little bit more of individual training. I do wish that um, just to develop certain things, right? But once I got in it, like I, I was lucky to have guys that would let me train for free and stuff like that, um, just off of my name, right? Um, and they would let us train for free. But like, so I'm like, I'm here getting this training for free. I know some of these people are in here paying. I'm like, I gotta go hard, yeah. right? And so. I think that's one thing is like in that hour, in that hour 30 that you're, that you're in there working hard, always think about there's another person working that hour, hour 30 as well. So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about the dude across town. He over there getting his drills in as well. So he do an hour. I might do an hour. Then I might have to make a hundred, make a hundred shots after, after the workout or something like that. Right. So I think that's something that's huge. Like always have that edge to work harder than the next person and you'll see yourself grow as, you know, as, as a catalyst to that, man. Absolutely. And uh, we always say that you can't replace game experience. Uh, here, exactly. You, yep. you, can't, you can't replace it. And so, obviously, uh, we, we say the training is where you're going to work on your game. You work on your craft. You put different tools in your toolbox. But then exactly. the, the game is where you showcase it. And I love exactly. how, how T – his philosophy, man, he, he just always grew up trying to find the best competition. And so my encouragement to you listening yep. right now, don't back down from the best competition. You're the best player in the gym. You better find somewhere else to play. You better go, exactly. You better go <laughs> seek out better competition so you can get better. Because you, if you're just out there dominating all the time, you ain't getting better. So Exactly. T, you're an elite player. Uh, is there, and you've kind of dropped some names here already, but – uh, for you to become an elite player, there's a two-part question here. I want to know if there's like a coach, a mentor, a trainer that you can really credit. Uh, but also, what are some of your favorite drills? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start with the coaching question because that's something that's really dear to me because, like I said, I didn't have a, a father figure in my life. Well, my father wasn't in my life. I, I spoke to him, you know, over the phone. 
um, he was away, you know, he was in, he was in prison for most of my life. <clears throat> so, you know, he did give me the, you know, the on, on the phone talks and stuff. He played basketball as well, but that in-person stuff came from multiple co it's crazy, you know, that people gave me their time and put their time into me now that I'm thinking about it. Right. Cause I'm, I, I'm so busy nowadays that I'm like, dang, like these dudes took their time to come and coach me for this many hours and all that stuff. So it's so many coaches, man, that I can name, but I can go out, you know, I'll, I'll go up the list. You know, like I said, Red Taylor first got me into organized basketball, really put me on the map as far as that goes. I got David Hamilton who coached me when I was a youngster. He used to let me, you know, ride to the games with him. My mom had three boys, right? So right. she couldn't be at everything. <laughs> right. Um, so um, he would, you know, he was a big, a big, huge uh, part of my, you know, my early success as well. I got Cliff, big Cliff, you know, he was really Ronnie's coach, but he actually helped me out a lot, you know, in coaching. Um, um, but just going on to, you know, getting older, I had, you know, David, I mean, uh, uh, D'Artanian Wise, who I just was talking about was my eighth grade coach, huge, huge help. Um, Sean Bowden was my trainer. He trained me a lot. Um, and then I had Coach Green, who obviously, you know, trained, you know, got me on ba basketball um, on a higher level when it came to recruiting and all that stuff, put me in front of so many coaches, drove me to so many camps, all that type of stuff, um, you know. Um, and then I get to Coach Mitchell because that's that's going to that's always forever going to be my like um, that's my God, man. Like when it comes down to it, because not only did he break down everything on basketball but he broke it down and related it to life and that part is the part that I hadn't got yet right that's the part that I hadn't grew into yet every believe it or not sports and life are so synonymous you know what I mean and Absolutely. he was a he was a coach and a mentor like I said but he was more like a, a father from home like I was scared to get in trouble because of coach Mitchell or I was you know I didn't do certain things because of coach Mitchell right and when I did it he made me feel like a dumbass. Like if I did something that, that I, you know, that I shouldn't have done, and he made me feel like that every time, like not just one time, he checked everything that I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so he taught me so much about basketball and how it relates to life. You know, he used to say, for instance, you know, if you, you know, if you have a, a 2.0 GPA, well, guess what? Th those type of dudes, you got a 2.0 GPA, you're just getting by. He said, you're going to be the type of dude that has a 2.0 2 .2 wife. You're going to have 2.0 kids yes. riding around with, you know, with, with, with shitty pampers on and you're going to, your driveway is going to be full of snow because you, you haven't went out there and shoveled the snow. Like he's like, you're going to live a 2.0 life. Man. He's like, and, and man, that, that really made sense to me. Like it really got to me. Like, I was like, dang, that's crazy. Like, yeah. And seeing it now, those same guys, yeah. <laughs> to be completely honest, Hey, it spoke to be true. You know what I mean? So Isn't it crazy? Uh, I think, yeah, man, I think, you know, all of those guys that I just named, and I know I'm missing somebody, bro, but like, sure. I got a lot of, you know, father figures that mm -hmm. from not, not to say like, you know, they was, you know, doing so much on the father role, but they just kind of brought me in, mentored me, you know, took me to games, put me in great basketball situations. And I'm, I'm always going to be thankful for that because, you know, certain kids didn't get that. You know what I mean? That that could have probably went further than me. Absolutely, and uh, I'll just point out there that man for for all you 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 youngins listening, and uh, be thankful for those mentors, man. And uh, it takes an army. It takes an army. And uh, I, I love how T uh, he's been surrounded by great guys, and I love how his his uh, he credits Coach Mitchell as uh, he, he not only was a great mentor on the court, but he got to relate it to life. And those are the best mentors. And so if, you, if exactly. you're looking up to just care about you on the court, you know, that, 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 aren't, that, ain't, that ain't the real ones. You, you, you got to be looking for exactly. the that. And, and even to take it, <clears throat> to take it one step further, when I got to Purdue, Coach Painter, yeah. I, I still, I run, I run my business by how, literally, I told, I text him and told him this. I literally run my business by how he ran practice, how he ran his, his uh, program. It's crazy. But the, like, if you look at my business right now, it almost has the same respect, the same hard work, the grittiness, you know, everybody's as important from the janitor all the way up to the star of the team, all the way up to the coach. That's how I run my business now. Like it's crazy, but he gave me, he was like that too. He gave me a lot of like on the court, off the court lessons. 
You know what I mean? He was like, he already knew what I did. If I did Absolutely. something, he already knew. And I'll say, I'll say that I'll, I'll second that. I I, will, I was fortunate to spend one year with Coach Painter. And I, right. I will, I'll say this on this podcast right now. He's had an impact on my life that no one will yep. ever understand. And I, we run our yep. training business. I run my training business exactly like how he runs Purdue Basketball exactly. Program. Just he exactly. does things the right way. And so, man. That's, Absolutely, oh, bro. Shout Absolutely. out to Coach Painter. Definitely. And then when it comes to drills, man, I know I left that question out. I'll, I'll, I'll say for me, it used to be the, um, like I said, it was the competitive drills. Obviously I used to love competitive drills because I used to love winning <laughs> for one. Um, but hey, when it real comes quick, to me, real quick, real quick. Do yeah. Yeah. You, so this is, I keep hearing you say this about love winning. Do you love to win more than you hate to lose? <sighs> That's which, tough which, there. Which one motivates you? You know what I'm saying? Like, which one motivates you? Do you just the love for winning or do you just hate to lose? I'm just curious. I'm going to say hate to lose, bro. And I know that sounds bad, <laughs> but I'm going to say hate to lose. And the reason why I say that is, um, and, and it's kind of changed now, right? But um, for me, like in the real estate world now, it's more, it's a little bit different because like, even in life, bro, even in basketball, like I said, everything is so synonymous, but like when you lose, you learn a lesson. Yeah. Like losses are not failures, they're lessons, right? Yes. So when Amen. I lost to someone, like, but I, what reason why I say hate to lose because that was in my playing days. I Like literally sometimes, bro, like I would lose a high school game and like I, when my mom and them knew not to say anything to me when I was at home. Like I used to go straight into my, bro, sometimes I didn't take, my, I know this sounds nasty. I didn't take my tape off. I didn't do anything. I went straight to sleep. I was that mad. I was that mad, bro. Like I would leave the game. Everybody, you know, usually after the game, I'm hugging, talking to everybody. Hey, what's up, T? Cool. Yeah. Everybody knew not to talk to me after a game, bro, if I lost. I'm walking straight to the car. I'm out of there. I'll yeah. see you tomorrow in practice. And I can't wait to the next game to get yes. that win to feel better again. Right. Yeah, I so that was like that's why I say that. That, that is that yeah. epic story right there. I don't know, man. Yeah. I don't know many players right now that would after the game go straight to bed without even taking their tape off, man. Bro. But Bro. that's all. That's just that's just straight up passion, and that is carried over. Eight o'clock. Uh, that eight thirty. Just like T said, that's carried over into his professional life now, and I can see it. Absolutely. That, that's Absolutely, so cool. bro. But sorry, I took, off, I took you off the question. What, what, oh yeah, so the drill. The drills? Um, it would have to be the the one on one drills where you get three dribbles, and I like that because um, I did, in high school we would just do a one on one drill. You can dribble as much as you want, but you got to think about it. In a college basketball game, if you're going to get to your spots, you know you're going to get there in two to three dribbles. Yes, it's that yes. right. So. Um, I think that was a huge drill for me that really helped my game. Cause like if I'm coming off a screen and I'm able to, you know, if I'm if I'm I'm coming off a curl and the big man has picked me up, it's gonna take me one or two dribbles to get past him, you know, to get to the basket and make my move, right? You can't yep. just sit out there just messing around, blah, 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 you know, and then it's only 30 seconds on the shot clock <laughs> when it right. comes down to it. So what are you gonna do? You know, you're gonna dribble the whole shot clock now. Um, so I think that really helped the development of my game, bro. Um, and obviously I like the aspect again, this goes back to me playing, but I like, like, you know, the experience with playing against good defense. I'm playing against Lewis Jackson and practice locking me up. Yep. I'm like, if, if I can get past him, I can get past anybody in the big 10. I knew that. Yep. Right. Yep. <laughs> so I'm like, like, that, that was a big drill for me right there, man. And, um, and, and obviously, you know, there's individual drills that, that get you right. But I liked a lot of the shooting drills, um, to, you know, coming off of screens, getting your footwork, right because that's something that's huge too. If you can get your footwork right, I mean, you can do a lot of stuff in basketball, bro. Absolutely. Those are fantastic drills. And I, I agree with you, man. I, I love the, the dribble limit drills where you got to really focus and make those dribbles count. Uh, rarely are right. you get, get more than two to three dribbles in a game uh, to make your move, to get your shot off. So, right. T, really kind of to close this podcast, really this podcast mm -hmm. is really to inspire people in their walk of life, no matter where they're at. And uh, I just want to hear mm -hmm. about you talking about a time where you experienced some adversity. Our definition of competing is doing what God is calling you to do, even when it's hard. And the valleys are always coming, man. But those who fight through the adversity become better. So share a time with us that you really had to fight through some adversity as we close. Right. Um, and I, I did see this question. This is one thing that 
and I, I know I get kind of long winded, so I'll try to keep it a little shorter. But oh, when it comes down to it, bro, I've literally been going through adversity like my whole life. So I'm just gonna name a like kind of like a chronological order of kind of some adversity that really hit that really showed that um you know you can still move forward, right? You hmm. can still do something to move forward, right? So, like I said, when I was younger. My dad went to jail when I was, first of all, my dad was my role model, like, as a whole. Like, I just wanted to always be with my dad, all of this stuff. So he, he left our family when he was, like, when I was eight years old, right? So now, you know, there was one time where I went to visit, where he was like, you're the man of the family now. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm eight years old. He's telling me I'm the man of the family. So I'm yep. like, okay. I took that, you know, I took that on my shoulder. Like, I got I to gotta do this. Um, so that was one thing. And then, you know, I was able to, I didn't do certain stuff and stuff like that because I knew my younger brothers was watching me, you know, and I knew that pretty much I'm like a father figure to them now. My other brother was eight years old. He had, he was born after my father, you know, went to jail. So he, I'm like his role model to a T, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that was something, that's the first piece of adversity where like, you know, I would go to practice and stuff like that. And I would always be with somebody else's dad. You know, I would always be with somebody else's, um, uh, you know, uh, father. When it come down to it, like I see, you know, even when we used to go train with Yogi and them and stuff like that, just seeing, you know, his dad put that much time into him. Like, I'm not going to lie. It was kind of a, a little bit of envy with that. Right. Um, and I think that's just because, you know, I really wanted that. But, hey, what about what was I going to do? Stop playing because I didn't have, you know, he wasn't there. No. Kept moving forward, you know, all the way throughout my career with basketball, bro. Um, but, you know, I tore my ACL early on. Yeah. <laughs> that was a that was a huge one um, that really, really set me back. But again, just sitting out, I was like, what can I do to get better while I'm out? So I used to stretch like crazy. I got super flexible. I used to stretch like crazy. Yeah. And then I used to and then I used to watch certain stuff. So I'm like, when I start back playing, I know that I can do this. Or I can do this, make this move or that was a bad move here or that was a bad pass there. I wouldn't do that. I would have jump stopped there or whatever. I used to really watch and like be getting better in my head mentally you know, <clears throat> learning the game of basketball. So I'm, while I'm sitting out, I'm going to every game still. I'm not just at home chilling, playing the game, you know, stuff like that. I'm going to every game still, like a travel game. I don't right. have to be there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so that was something that definitely hit me. Um, on the back end of stuff, you know, um, in college, obviously, you know, I had a rough patch. I had a, um, I had tore my meniscus yep. in my leg. And this was one of the most times of adversity, like in basketball that I ever faced, because like I wasn't even the star of the team or nothing like that when it happened. Right. So I wasn't even somebody that really, you know, was definitely had a starting spot or nothing like that. So going into my sophomore year at Purdue, I was uh, playing open gym in Indianapolis. Like I said, I'm always playing and I tore my meniscus. Well, I was, you know, in a good position to start, you know, that summer I did really good in the workouts, all that stuff. And then yep. boom, got hurt out for a long time. Um, so by the time the season start, I'm not even all the way back, like when it comes down to it. So I don't start, um, which kind of, you know, it's not, it wasn't a big deal to me. I feel like I could get there, but we, we were playing all the way up until we went to Puerto Rico. You know, I'm, I'm probably averaging four points, you know, I'm coming off the bench. I'm doing all right, but you know, I know that I'm better than this, right. The whole time. Yeah. So, yeah. man, I used to, my wife now, I used to always, you know, we used to always talk about it and stuff like that. And I used to be chilling with her really putting all my pain on her like man I can't yeah. believe this like you know what I mean like and I just remember coach Painter saying you know like um I would be mad too is what he said <laughs> he's like I would be mad too if I didn't play uh, play that much tonight even though we won the game like I was he, he could tell that like I still had something in me where I was like I knew I could have did better tonight and so we went to Puerto Rico played after Puerto Rico I kind of turned the leaf because I really didn't play at all in Puerto Rico we lost to Alabama I remember and yeah. after that, by mid-season, so sophomore year, I was, like, going up, like, starting. Like, you know, I came – because I still came to practice every day, played as hard as possible, bro. But literally, I used to have to, you know, get injections into my knee. I used to have to – I had a big cyst in the back of my knee. So, I had to, like, get it drained before games. Like, it was crazy, bro, where I couldn't even, like – I had, like, an egg in the back of my knee is what it was. Yeah. And it was like, man, it would, it would hurt so bad. But then I was like, nah, like, I got to get this spot back. I got to, you know, I got to get back in the groove. And I did that. And going to the, you know, 
into the tournament and all of that stuff. Like I actually started, I mean, I was going, I was going off. Like it was me and actually Robbie, I think was leading us in scoring. It was me and him at the end of the season that was really like, you know, pushing it, but we had a great thing going like me, Lewis, Ryan, um, Kelsey, Robbie, like we would, we would play off of each other really well at the end of that season. I just loved it. And it was crazy because at the beginning of the season, I was like, my season is over in my head. Right. Because I was just like, man, like this is crazy, but I, I still had to push through. That was a big, um, that was a big um, time for adversity for me, for sure. Um, and, you know, after college, leaving the game of basketball, like I played overseas, I did good stuff like that. Um, but when I came back, one of the teams dropped me because I came back to see my son born, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they dropped me when I came back. They was mad that I left to, to come back, and I was always going to do that anyhow. Um, but <clears throat> that was a big time of our adversity for me because I felt like I didn't have anything to roll over into. Like, I know I had my degree and stuff like that, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't specialize in anything in my degree. Um, and so I got into, you know, um, I got a job that I really much didn't like. I just got it because I had a kid to take care of. You know, my wife was doing well. She was a nursing at the time. She was, you know, starting to build up. And I'm like, same thing. I'm like, I can't let her do well. And I can't, and, and I don't, you know, reciprocate that. So I'm like, no. what am I going to do? You know, and man, I started to dive really into this real estate stuff, had some adversity, you know, early on where I lost money actually, but I stick, I stuck with it. And, you know, now today, you know, not to boast or brag or anything like that, but that was like three years ago. And now today I own like 50 properties in Indianapolis where, I first started doing everything yet. You know what I mean? So right. it just showed me that I can get over that hump. I can do what I want to do. You know, I don't have a day job. I, I quit my day job a while back and, you know, I've been running my own business and, and moving forward with that ever since. And, and it all came from that adversity um, because believe it or not, my father went back to jail <laughs> and, you know, my family kind of, I wanted to put a different imprint on our family, on our legacy. And that was something that adversity actually helped me because I've been going through it my whole life. So when I see it now, I know it's coming and I'm like, okay, I know there's going to be better times. There's light at the end of this tunnel. And that's something that I always got in my head. You know, I know there's always something that's, that can come, but I always know that there's light at the end of that tunnel. Definitely. Man, that, that is so inspiring. <laughs> to me. And uh, uh, for all you listeners, you can just hear how, T is just built different. And he, it, every time adversity has hit, hit him in his life, uh, he knew light, there was light at the end of the tunnel, just had that positive attitude. And um, you get adversity either makes you or breaks you. And it, it's, yep. and, and uh, I saw a quote today that uh, everything in your past is building you for your future. And that oh, is, man. That, that, that let, is, me, let me actually intervene one time on that because um, I remember. I was getting in a little trouble on campus, stuff like that. Um, not, not big trouble, but I was, you know, doing some teenage, you know, 19-year-old oh, yeah. things on campus, whatever. And I remember talking to Coach Painter. He brought me in his office. It was me and him. And he said, you know, you had a lot of adversity in your life. Like, I know your whole life story. He actually knew my dad from, like, back in the day when he used to play basketball and stuff. And he was like, I actually, you know, I know your story. He was like, you actually got a good story. You passed all that in the adversity and stuff. Don't screw your story up. Mm. Don't go AWOL because, you know, go crazy because, you know, you feel like you got all this on your back. Don't mess your story up. Elevate your story. I was like, that made so much sense. <laughs> After that, I think about that all the time. I can't mess my story up. I can't mess it up. <laughs> like, that was You're crazy. You're preaching, T. You're preaching. <laughs> and, uh, man, th th that is such a great way to, to end this podcast. So my encouragement to you listeners uh, man, I can't wait to go back and re-listen to this whole podcast and uh, man, so much that we can uh, take from Tyrone's story. He, he didn't mess his story up. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's cool to see where he is today and how uh, he fought through that adversity. So for you listeners, always compete, always do what God calls you to do, even when it's hard.